morning, church. Good to see you. Good to be with you gathering. Welcome to this worship on this. It doesn't know what it's doing out there just yet. Drizzling, sun shining. Who knows what's happening, Marianne? It's something's happening out there. So it's good to be with you as we continue our worship series. Home sweet home. Uh, a celebration of nature in this place we call home here in Medina, but also on planet Earth. We have a lot coming up for you. We have the gathering band uh, giving, giving praise, helping us lead in worship. We have a, a story of beer cans on the side of the road. We have all sorts of fun happening, Rob. <laughs> so as we begin with this rocky start, we raise up a sign of peace because Lord knows we need it. And we look around to our neighbor saying, hey, neighbor, glad you're here. Peace be with you. <laughs> Let's Rob go ahead and to get stand. the last word in. All creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Sun, moon, and stars rejoice on high. Praise to the Lord of light divine. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Praise the Father above. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah for his infinite love. Sing hallelujah. Praise to the giver of good things. Merciful Father, Holy King. Join with the angels, sing out loud. Praise Him who reigns above the clouds. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Praise the Father above. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. For His infinite love. Sing hallelujah, I will hallelujah. praise him when the morning comes, hallelujah, of the rising sun, I will praise him when the day is done, hallelujah, praise the Lord above, I will praise him, hallelujah, hallelujah. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, praise the Father above. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, for His infinite love. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, praise the Father above. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, for his infinite love. Sing hallelujah. We who have lost our sense and our senses, our touch, our smell, our vision of who we are, we who frantically force and press all things without rest for body or spirit, hurting our earth and 
injuring ourselves, we call a halt. We, we want to rest. rest. We, we need, need to rest. rest. Allow, Allow the, the earth, earth to rest. rest. May this worship be a call to Sabbath. For, for ourselves and our, our home, sweet, sweet home. home. We observe your Sabbath command, O oh God, a space of quiet. For, for simply, simply being me, and letting, letting be. Me. For recovering the great forgotten truths. For, for learning how to live again. again. Amen. Amen. We switch the order of service. We gather now our joys and concerns, the things that are on our hearts and minds from this past week and that are on our minds for the future. Um, we have several birthdays all happening on the 30th, so this list is all birthdays that are happening today. Logan Allen, Sydney Benson, Bailey Olin, Ken Smith, Ann Usher, Ian White, and Adeline Magrum. All April 30th birthdays, happy birthday. And then birthdays coming this week in May. Marianne Andrews, Abby Yates, Amanda Nevy, Aiden Rubino, Nancy Ratz, and Stephanie Stepsis, happy birthday. And then a happy anniversary to John and Kathy Kavoris, whose anniversary is on the 4th. If you see those people, give them a happy birthday or a happy anniversary from us. Our concerns for this morning include the Armbrust family. Um, Kenzie's father, Mo, is still in the ICU, and we continue to hold them in prayer. We pray for Ashley Bonzel's uncle, Ray Wallace, who's having surgery on his voice box. We pray for Beth Jones, a neighbor of Alice Metzloff, who's having trouble with her knee surgery. We pray for the niece of um, our own Kathy Fathrack, Celeste, who has been hospitalized in an emergency situation, and we pray for Kathy and her family. We pray for Joyce Halter's dog, Jake, who is having surgery. We lift up John Bradshaw, who was in the hospital on Thursday and Friday and hoping for back surgery on the 3rd. This is Cindy's father. We lift up the death of John Root, whose uh, memorial service will be Wednesday at 2 here. And we also lift up the death of Nick North's wife's cousin, Harriet, the person who introduced them, whose death they are mourning. Those are the joys and concerns that I brought with me to share. What did you bring on your heart and your mind, Vicki? for Linda's family. 
joys and concerns. With all of these things on the forefront of our minds and of our hearts, will you join your heart with mine in prayer, please? God of blossoming hope, here we join our hearts to pray together, not because we are certain of what the outcome of our prayers is going to be, but because in praying we join our weary souls together and we strengthen the connection of faith that we have with you. Each of us has brought many things with us into this room today. Our pain, our fears, and our doubts are all here with us. And so is our gratitude, our glimmers of hope, and all of the things that make us smile. These joys and concerns, they hold us in constant tension. We carry them around with us, and sometimes they can become quite heavy. To that you say, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So God, we set our burdens down now in this heart-joined space to share the load for a little while and to feel the network of love supporting us in this community. Together, we give thanks for all good things which come from you, for the joy we find and for the people that we find it with. And we ache alongside all of creation for the earth and for everything on it to be well. Holy One, hear our prayers. Send us sunshine and rain so that we may thrive. Heal the woundedness that leads us into wounding others. Let grace and peace abound within us and among us and lead us to life and life abundantly together. All of this we pray in the name of the one who led us in prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Some questions you might ask. Is the soul solid like iron? Or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth in the beak of the owl? Who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the moose is as sad as the face of Jesus. The swan opens her white wings slowly. In the fall, the black bear carries leaves into the darkness. One question leads to another. Does it have a shape, like an iceberg, like the eye of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung, like the snake and the scallop? Why should I have it and not the anteater who loves her children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think of it, what about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses and lemons and their shining leaves? What about the grass?
first scripture comes to us this morning from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 6 through 15. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, that you turn justice to woodworm, wormwood, and bring righteousness to the ground, the one who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash out against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate the one who reproves in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from the levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Who are we? Who am I? Why is it us that have... It's one of those mornings. So that question after I read that poem earlier this week, just sat heavy on my heart. And I realized the answer is cut both ways. It's important for us to consider as we sing this song, the words that we say. Who am, Who am I that the, the Lord of all the earth would, would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed on the ocean. Vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, 
But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed on the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Cause I am yours. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Cause I am yours. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Cause I am yours. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Cause I am comes to us from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him, because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to him. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Ben. That was a great song, perfectly chosen. And you guys sang that. That was good. It just You feel that in the room? That was wonderful. Thank you. So over the past two years, we found empty 24-ounce cans of Ice House beer in our neighborhood. Kate and I pick these up, we recycle them, but they keep appearing. So I've taken to calling this drinking and driving litterer the Ice House Bandit. Here are some questions I have asked about the Ice House Bandit. Why are these cans here? Who's throwing them out? Who is this person? How old are they? What is causing them to drink and drive and announce it through litter? And why does it happen to only be in the Forest Meadows area? Does the Ice House Bandit not see the beauty all around them? The Canada Goose opens her brown wings slowly. The neighbor's black dog carries sticks around her backyard. One question leads to another. Do they not see my kids? those out walking. One thing that's so different about you, Medina, from any other place that I've lived, is that every day there are people out walking. Kelly's one of them. I've seen her around. More than any other previous places of residence, no matter the weather, we will pass at least a minimum of three people in our metro parks. This is science. You can go out and verify it for me. If you're out, no matter the weather, you'll pass at least three people, no matter what. It's been true for the last six years we've lived here. It makes you, makes me love you even more, Medina. I hate that someone is drinking and driving on the streets that our children play on. 
I'm as mad as the prophet Amos about the ice house bandit. Yet, here's the thing about the prophet Amos and the prophets in general. The prophets aren't speaking or writing about the individual. This is not directed just to the ice house bandit. It's directed to the entire nation. The prophets are always writing to the collective. So Amos critiques Israel, and the prophet states, they hate the one who reproves in the gate. The city gate was the site of most public activity during the day, according to many scholars. There you could, provi- you could expect to find a community elder who would help settle disputes before it went before the judge and the lawyers. The reprover was one to remind the community of the law and the tradition to uphold the cause of the poor and deal fairly with the rich. Now, Amos isn't making this up. His critique that we read today stems right from the law, from Leviticus 19. Don't hold back the wages of hired help. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor, favoritism to the great. Judge your neighbor fairly. The law is for the benefit of all people. So Amos is critiquing his nation of not living up to their own standards Standards that are baked right into their law, the Torah. The first three types of sacrifices prescribed by Leviticus are optional. Sacrifices for gratitude. The whole law is generated at a sense of gratitude, and we miss this. We Christians often feel we're better. We supersede the law, but the law is there and based on gratitude. Just hypothetically, have any of you quit a job. Have you ever quit a job that just was killing your soul? Anyone? Same here. Now imagine, hypothetically, that not just your soul, but the soul of your ancestors going back 500 years. (laughs) Then you might start to understand the book of Exodus. A logical response and desire to show gratitude after quitting that job, after the chain-breaking God who freed you from your captivity in Egypt. That's where it begins. That's the source in generate, what generates the law. That's where Leviticus starts. You can have priests enact a burnt offering, a grain offering, or an offering of well-being. If It's optional. It's not prescribed. The way you do it is prescribed, but not the fact that you must do it at any given time. It's whenever you choose to do it. If you have a lot and you can afford a bull, then offer that. If You can't afford a bull, but you can only offer a goat. Offer that, sure. If you can't afford that, a bird like a turtle dove or a pigeon to show your gratitude, those are optional offerings for all class levels that they can give to be a part of this temple system. And this is how we know that the Holy Family was poor. For the firstborn son, they gave an offering, a burnt offering, of a pair of turtle doves in Luke chapter 2, verse 24. Now, granted, animal sacrifice may seem barbaric to us, but how wonderful there's this community way, this communal shared sense of how to show gratitude or express mourning. I think we've lost that. and Maybe a lot of things are coming out sideways. We can't show one another we're happy or sad, so we just snip at each other online. It does seem barbaric, but it's good to note that we kill more animals daily than the temple system ever did. In Rob Bell's book, Blood, Guts, and Fire, the Gospel According to Leviticus, he states that in our modern era, 23.3 million animals, 23.3 million animals are killed daily. That's factory farming for you. All that to say and ask this question of the Ice House Bandit is what level of society are they on? Are they a poor laborer who isn't making a daily wage that most of their you know, minimum wage gets sucked up in their gas to get to work because of the lack of affordable housing here in Medina and in America in general? I mean, we have society have always have great reasons not to raise the minimum wage, but we never manage to make or talk about a maximum wage. Amos and the other prophets take issue with the rich who push aside the needy in the gate. The book Nickel and Dime by Barbara Einrich is a great 
volume that points out that lower wage workers often work 10 to 12 hours a day and they're physically exhausted. So they turn to numbing behaviors like TV, cigarettes, pills, and alcohol. They might not be able to afford a big vacation. They rarely take vacation days, period. But they can afford those things. And I wonder if that's what's going on with our Ice House Bandit. Or the opposite could be true <laughs> of the Ice House Bandit. This person is actually a high-level CEO, maybe. The stress of their job, the burden of managing so many people in their professional and private life causes them to drink and drive. I would expect a better quality beer to be thrown out of their Audi or BMW, but who knows? No accounting for taste, I guess, Rob. The time away from their families, the sense that they don't like who they become, the weight of their responsibility presses on them, and I wonder if they, too, are turning to numbing behaviors. I wonder if that's what's going on with the Ice House Bandit. Or, Megan, I wonder if they haven't even, they don't even have a career yet. You remember high school, right? That weird, awkward time. Some of us do anyway, better than others. I wonder if they're just a stressed out, overscheduled high schooler. They have too many requirements and pressure and social weirdness and ACT and star exams and the stress of extracurriculars they may be in, or, and then add on a part-time job, and then you know, all the high school drama with their peers, and maybe even the first blush of what they think of is love and learning how to be a good partner with this relationship they're in. And then you put on social media, which none of us in this room largely had to deal with except for those three over there. What is happening with our high schoolers? That's the question we can ask. Is the Ice House Bandit on their way to the high school, coming off Reagan, going through and throwing out their morning kegs and eggs on their way to the high school? face whatever they have to face there. Those are some questions we could ask. Those are questions I ask as I sit at the gate, because I think that's the role of clergy, part of the call, to notice our common life together and to ask good questions, to ask uncomfortable questions. And I'm just trying to get us all, myself included, through the gate. Jesus is the gate. Our good shepherd came to live among us to show all the good things that God has gifted us with are right in front of us. The grouse, the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, our neighbor. And we have rejected this good news because I guess saying love your enemies and do good those who harm you will get you killed in this world, but saying let's go kill those people over there will get you elected to public office. So I have a lot of questions, and I wonder why our world rewards violence and greed. It always seems as though destructive ways are rewarded more than peaceful and sustainable ways. People we call a tree hugger when they point out the harm we're doing on this planet. Why is that a bad thing? I love trees. You love trees. We love trees. They give us oxygen. I guess if they produced Wi Fi, we'd be more forgiving of them. It was once said that polluted rivers meant jobs. That poor air quality is progress and bread on your table. And when the prophets came and said, maybe we shouldn't have rivers you could set on fire in Cleveland, we said, be gone with you, because that's job threatening. That's threatening to our jobs. I mean, so we go into apathy. And we rebuke those prophets. We won't listen to the ones who come to say, maybe we should chop, stop chopping down trees. Maybe we should stop being so harmful and degraded to our environment that we live in. I mean, there was that one woman in Sweden who's still very passionate about living sustainably on the earth, but she's been subjected to such abuse. Do she, does she even matter now? Are we even listening to her? Or are we just calling her a communist and slandering her more? When you walk in our doors downstairs, you'll see a sign made by one of our children. There is no planet B. We don't have any place to turn to if we insist on destroying this planet. And we have not been kind to our home sweet home. We've gotten better. Our rivers aren't on fire. Our lakes are 
fewer algae blooming, I guess. But Amos talks about how the indulgent ways of Israel caused the land itself to reject the people and send them into exile. You see, the land is a character in the Torah. We are commanded to take care of the land. We are to steward it. The dominion that we have been given in Genesis over the land was for its stewardship and health, not for its abuse. As you read in Exodus 23.10, Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but in the seventh year, remember, seven right there in the back that Tanner has been pointing out to us, seven, the seventh year shall let the land rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the fields may eat. Exodus and Leviticus have many laws and regulations related to the use and management of the land, including instructions for agricultural practices and our diet, Sabbath and Jubilee years, allocation of land among the tribes of Israel. And prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos, and more point back to the law, to the Torah, to tell the people, the nation of Israel, y'all, you didn't follow those laws, and that's why we're in this mess. So I have a few questions of you. Once again, reminder, you're a congregationalist. I can only suggest it's up to you. You are the ones who vote on things. I don't even get a vote. I just say, how about this? And you can be like, no. Great. Good conversation, congregation. <laughs> so a few questions I ask of you. When I first arrived here, I saw we had a lot of paper waste. So we connected through Medina County Recycling Center. We got our blue recycling bins that we've been using ever since. The staff continues to empty these out each and every week. I think that was a good step. Maybe our next step is around coffee hour. Maybe around our funeral luncheons and the paper products we insist on using. We have a wonderful Hobart dishwasher that's super fun to use. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do. I think I had the pancake breakfast or the dinner for Mardi Gras just to run the Hobart. No other reason. The caring team has said that they are way over budget. Our paper products are just way over budget this year. But we have this real supply of real plates. We could wash them. So I wonder if that's something we could aim for this coming fall, or if you all get huffy and motivated, maybe the summer. Using the dishwasher more and paper products less is not only good for the earth, but it's good for the budget, and a lower budget means you can lower your tithe. No. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you just keep it the same, but more of it goes to feeding and loving our neighbors or retaining our amazing staff like Megan, who doesn't ask such questions of you. You like her, maybe not this guy, but more of it will go to her, less to paper plates. That's a good thing. The roof above our head is in need of replacing. That's a fun fact. And with our rising energy costs, I wonder how we could be stewards in that realm. Shall we put solar panels above there? That would be a nice three- to five-year goal. I'm sure with the right team we could accomplish that goal. I wonder what other options we could think of if that's a non-starter. That's too daunting for us. Recently, or well, not recently, felt, feels recently, last year we visited England on spring break. My family was rather confused by one of our hotel rooms. They walked in and they did as kids do. They jump on the beds and they click all the buttons and turn on all the stuff, but nothing would turn on. I'm like, turn on a light, stop jumping in the dark. And they're like, ha, 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 no, we can't, they're not working. Like, what do you mean they're not working? So I stomp in the room and I'm looking for the phone. They don't have a landline in the room anymore. So I'm stomping on my way out to go to the front desk all huffy. And I notice there's a little LED light up in the shape of my card, the card I used to get into the room. Then I slipped in the little slot and it unlocked and got me in there. And I'm like, hmm. Boop. All the lights turn on. That is a cool feature. That's an amazing energy-saving feature. I need to take the key to get out. What's going to make me remind me of the key? 
all the lights on behind me. I can take that out, all the lights go off, we save energy, we don't save energy, the motel saves energy, so therefore I pay a lower hotel rate, right? That should work, economy of scale. Maybe, I don't know, it was cheaper. And when Sam and Kate spent a week in there, we're very thankful for those cheap rates, <laughs> probably because of that key card. I don't know, it's all hypothetical. Well, it's just a question I ask. I thought that was a wise approach to saving energy. I have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers these days except for one answer. One thing I'm pretty sure about is that drinking and driving and throwing beer cans out the window are not exactly a healthy practice, nor what the Lord requires of us. So I'm reminded each and every time I pick up a can to pray for my neighbor, the Ice House Bandit. As I'm also thinking of hat plots to catch them, I haven't figured one out, so if you have one, I need, I need some ideas but mainly to pray and to work for their health and wholeness is our job of people of faith. So that that day will come where all shall experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. So may we turn from our destruction of our greed and learn to live in right relationship with our God, with our neighbor, and with this planet on which we reside. Amen. I need, I need a volunteer. Thank you, Mr. Swantek. Come forward, please. We're going for a little phrase, participation over perfection, and we had a lot of participation, not a lot of perfection today with our feedback and pops and all that, so I'm going to invite Mr. Alex Swantek forward. You'll know what to do. Don't worry about it. So we come to the table, all ages. You're not the Ice House Bandit. That's not why I brought you up here. So we'll put you right here, right in the middle, as this young man reminds us that all are invited to the table. Every single one of you. All of us to taste and see that the Lord is good. No matter your age, your class, your race, what you think of Jesus and who he is for you. This table's for everyone's well-being. And we are all invited. So we're reminded when he took the bread, when he took the bread, <laughs> and he lifted it up, and he broke it, you got it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. We remember that. Thank you, Alex. We remember how he took the cup and he poured it. He's doing great, right? And he didn't even pour it once. He poured it twice on our table, right, Alex? He got it, nailed it. And he said, this is a cup of my blood shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. When you do this, you do so in remembrance of me, right, Alex? That's what he did. He knows that. You know that. So let us pray. Holy One, we thank you that we get to participate in this time of sacrament at your table. You know that we are not perfect. You know that we're just not ever going to get everything right. We're going to try. We're going to miss it and miss you in the lilies and the sparrow and in our neighbor. But it's the participation that leads to our perfection. So keep us, all your people, within your gate. May we taste and see that you are good. You have set before us the ways of life and death. May we choose life and have it abundantly in and through you so we can give it without regard to our neighbor. Rich, poor, high schooler, elder, Reprover within the gate, Ice House Bandit. Thank you for this time. Be with us as we come forward. Our God, our Christ, our Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
You are my heart, and I am yours forever. You are my strength, God of grace and power. in your hand still you make time for me I can't understand praise you God of earth and sky how beautiful is your unfailing love unfailing love and you never change God you remain the Holy One and my unfailing love, unfailing love. You are my rock, the one I hold on to. You are my song, and I sing to you. in your hand still you make time for me I can't understand I praise you God of earth and sky how beautiful is your unfailing love unfailing love and you never change God you remain the Holy One and my unfailing love, unfailing love. I praise you, God of earth and sky, how beautiful is your unfailing love, unfailing love. And you never change, God, you remain the Holy One and my unfailing love unfailing love unfailing love coming along in the awkwardness you figured it out why did he figure it out? Because he was recently inducted to the National Honor Society this past week. Congratulations <laughs> to Alex. Friends, let us pray. Holy One, we thank you. We thank you for the spring rain for this time under this roof that is holding and not leaking. We appreciate the small mercies of every day and the work of others whom we enjoy. We thank you for your unfailing love that keeps us at your table and keeps inviting us back. You would require our participation over our perfection. May we do the same. In your name we pray. Amen. Many of you know my favorite verse. It's in Micah. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice. To love mercy and walk humbly with your God. I'm reminded of this when I think of his closing song. Because what's not required, but what's appropriate, is to say thank you. Let's stand and praise God. When I see the beauty of a sunset's glory Amazing artistry across the Indian sky. When I feel the mystery of 
a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When I hear the story, suffered by our side of the cross they nailed you to that could not hold you now you're making all things new by the power of your risen life what can I do but thank you what can I do but give my life to you Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do but praise you every day, make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do but thank you, what can I do but give my life to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, what can I do but praise you every day, make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. something you would like to do. We're going to vote on it. Give you a thumbs up if it's a yes. If it's a nay, thumbs down. Motion carries. Okay, every fifth Sunday. When's the next fifth one? Is it May? July maybe? So we'll take a look. We'll let you know when that is. So we'll start that in practice because we require participation over perfection. That's what we're about. I think that's our way forward from what I'm getting. July 30th, mark it. July 30th. Vicki, you want that first? Okay, because she was ready to go today. But no pressure. You're up for it. So everybody in favor of Vicki on July 30th. There it is. There it is. Yes. Participation over perfection, friends. Okay. We also re would like your participation on our annual report day. The annual meeting will be May 23rd at 10 a.m. 21st. See, this is why I don't do this. 
It is a Tuesday. See, that's why we need 21st. Thank you. May 1st. It's going to be May. It's going to be May tomorrow. That's when your reports are due because we will read them and vote upon our new slate of leaders on the 21st at 10 a.m. We hope to see you there. The ladies' till tea and quilt raffle are out there uh, in the East Room. If you haven't got your tickets, please do so now. That's on the 20th, I'm pretty sure. And Mother's Day, I do know, is Sunday. May 14th, we are having a special offering for our Amanda Fund. Amanda Fund was created, you can ask Kelly more about this, but based on some uh, someone who was in the hospital for a long period and needed their bills paid, this goes to children in our, just not just in our church, but in our neighborhood to apply for this grant to help out with medical bills. Uh, so that special offering will happen on Mother's Day. And who knows, maybe our own Celeste, uh, Kathy's niece, might use some funds. We don't know. Those are the things we know of. Uh, those are in our bulletins. If you have any questions, please see me or any of our office staff. But for now, please join me in the benediction. We are praising God and now assembled here in church, but when we go our separate ways, it and might seem like we stop praising God. But if we do not cease to live a just life, we shall always be praising God. You cease to praise God only when you swerve from the path of justice. If you never turn aside from that path, your tongue may be silent, but your life will cry, Alleluia. Having been blessed to be a blessing, go from here to cry, Alleluia, for this service is ended, and our service now begins. Amen. Thank you.